Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is a traditionalist critique of Alexander Dugin, the prominent Russian political, social, and metaphysical theorist, one of the most prominent thinkers in Russia today, and a man perhaps whose ideas have brought us to the brink of a third world war. My guest is Charles Upton, whose first two books of poetry were published in 1968 and 1969. He was considered at that time the youngest of the beat generation of poets. He was just a high school student back then. He subsequently became engaged in metaphysics and the traditionalist movement and is author of many books, including Knowings in the Art Arts of Metaphysics, Cosmology, and the Spiritual Path, The Science of the Greater Jihad, Essays in Principial Psychology, The System of the Antichrist, Truth and Falsehood in Postmodernism and the New Age, Vectors of the Counter-Initiation, The Course and Destiny of Inverted Spirituality, the Alien Disclosure Deception, The Metaphysics of Social Engineering. And today we'll be focusing on his book, Dugan Against Dugan, A Traditionalist Critique of the Fourth Political Theory. Charles is in Lexington, Kentucky. And now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Charles. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. Yes, I'm glad to be back. We'll be sort of shifting gears a little bit today because I, I know we've talked about the Covenants Project, which is important political activism on your part. But in order to address the metaphysical ideas of Alexander Dugan, we really need to get into politics to some degree, which is a, a change of pace. I bet that most of our viewers will be unfamiliar with who Dugan is in spite of his his prominence today. And you just informed me, for example, that his books are not carried on Amazon. Yeah, any anymore. I mean, they, they they've been uh, they've been censored off of Amazon. So <clears throat> if we consider Dugan to be one of the major ideologues behind Russians and Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which I believe is true, we're no longer able to study his ideas because, ooh, if we, if we read his ideas, suddenly we'll, we'll all be pro-Russian. I don't think so. That isn't what happened to me when I read his ideas. But I mean, you know, I, I, ha I have to stand for freedom of speech. You know, if it's possible to censor Dugan, maybe I can be censored tomorrow, you know, or anyone else. So uh, I, I would like to say to Amazon, bring back the books of Alexander Dugan. So if indeed Russia is our enemy, we should understand our enemy a little bit better. Should we not? Well, I do know that uh, my old friend Jason Giorgiani, who was once editor of Arctos, the company that publishes Dugan, informed me uh, back in the days when Jason and I were in better communication that Dugan was their most popular author. Uh, now, that was a far-right publishing company, so I have to think that his ideas have infiltrated the far-right uh, throughout the world. Yeah, well, that, that was certainly his um, one of his goals. Uh, Except, you know, D Dugan will speak to anybody in their own language. I mean, he, he has things to say to the communists. He has things to say to the neo-pagans. He has things to say to the to Russian Orthodox Christians. He has things, I believe, from a few indications to say to the Satanists. You know, a, a little word word to the wise, you know, is stuck in there in, in his very convoluted writing. Oh, you know, his his idea... Is that that if Russia or Eurasia, you know, is, is to throw off the, the 
hegemony of the West and, you know, and, you know, maintain its independence and take its, its, uh, its own course through history without, you know, being contained, uh, by, by, by the West, by, you know, the European Union and the United States, that it will have to appeal to all of the groups who feel marginalized by European Union and the United States and, and their, their dominant um, agenda. And that means he collects incredibly heterogeneous influences and, and speaks in many, many different languages to many different disaffected groups, which is, well, that's what the communists did. Um, one example, there's a book, I forget the author, but it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting book called uh, Red Shambhala. And it was talking about how, how the Bolsheviks, you know, during before, I suppose, and during the revolution, fanned out through Central Asia and talked to, to the Mongols and, and, and the Tibetans and whoever, you know, uh, those populations were and, and, and spoke to them in terms of their eschatological hopes for a savior to come out of that form of Buddhism. Uh, and, and they said, well, that's us. You know, we, we, we are, we are your expected Messiah, the Bolsheviks. You know, we're all Asians, right? You know, and whatever. And, uh, so, so you know, it, his, his technique is very venerable. And certainly he's appealed to many different groups in the West. You know, some, a few years ago during the, the um, what was it called? You know, the yellow, yellow vest revolution in Europe, um, which was a kind of a, one of these, flash, flash demonstration, flash revolution things that end up to be a flash in the pan. You know, everybody talks to each other on, on the web and say, get together and demonstrate. And they do it and they do it and it's big and then it disappears completely because there's no organization and there's no, you know, creating a, 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 a you know, any kind of central direction uh, because that's considered to be well, you can't do that because the groups are too heterogeneous. And if somebody comes out of one group and says, well, we're running things, all the other groups will shoot them down. So all you can do is have these. That, that, that's what happened with um, uh, Occupy Wall Street some years ago. You know, uh, millions of different heterogeneous, you know, people who felt marginalized by what's going on in this country came together and demonstrated together. And then nothing because there was no no central leadership because th that was considered to be dangerous because if somebody is a leader then they, then they become a tyrant and we don't want that so we'll just we'll just make it a flash in the pan and you know and say we did it you know so that's as far as that goes so um but certainly yeah he, his ideas have been um taken up by uh the alt right and uh, but I, I, I recently was contacted by somebody from the old right who interviewed me and, and wished to say, you know, he, he's sitting here in Europe, you know, f you know, feeling the direct threat from Russia. And, and he says, I, I, I think my, my, you know, compatriots in the old right have been a little hasty to adopt Alexander Dugan as their guy because look which way the, the missiles are pointed, you know? And so, uh, yeah, I said, yeah, I just agreed more or less, you know. You quoted Dugan at one point um, in his writings as having said that pointing the missiles back towards the West was a form of psychotherapy for the Russian military. <laughs> yes, well, temporarily, I'm sure that was, uh, you know, it, it, uh, did it, did it allay uh, anxiety, anxiety temporarily, perhaps, but not, uh, not in the long run by any means. I want to say one thing before we go any further. I want to say, um, I want to express to Alexander Dugan my condolences on the loss of his daughter, who was assassinated not long ago in a car bombing. And it, it, it looked as if the, uh, the bomb was meant for him. And, you know, they changed cars. She took the car and she was killed. So, uh, I, I know how. Um, devastating that would be for any parent. And uh, what's interesting, even though um, Alexander Dugan's books have been um, 
kicked off of Amazon. They've been censored. Uh, he hasn't been kicked off of Facebook because his, his Facebook group is still there. And perhaps that's for purposes of surveillance to see what he might be up to. I imagine that's the only reason he's still there. But I'm getting emails from him now. You know, he posts, you know, new posts uh, on his website are, uh, are emailed to me and in English. Yeah. Yeah. In English. And he, no, he, he, he can speak English as well. Yeah. This is an English language, uh, Facebook group. So he, you know, he commands the English language pretty well. Um, and I go there and I just see pictures of little girls playing, you know, in, in, in the grass and the flowers around a, a Russian Orthodox monastery, you know, which, you could say this is an attempt to project harmlessness, although it's a little late for that. But it could also simply be a form of mourning, you know. Well, it's a sad thing that he lost his daughter. I agree. I know it's controversial as to how that happened and, and who did it. But perhaps it would help our readers to our viewers and listeners to have a, a better idea of uh, who he is? What is his history? I know, for example, you refer to him in your book as professor. Oh yeah, well, he's been a professor at University of Moscow, and you know, uh, I don't, I don't remember all of his posts, but um, he, his 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 father was uh, some Soviet official in what capacity? I don't remember. So he was already part of, you know, more or less part of the Soviet elite, and then the, the Soviet Union fell. And, uh, bef before the Soviet Union fell, he, he, he was, you know, was anti-Soviet at one point. And, uh, he, he was actually a singer. He was like, he was like, like a, a Nazi Bob Dylan who <laughs> was go around to cafes and, and, and sing, you know, satirical songs against the Soviet system, you know. And then it fell. And then, and then as soon as it fell, sometime later, he said, and then I really missed it, you know. You know, I saw I saw what what happened after that. You know, so um, he, he he as a professor, he's he's been and, and as a political organizer, I forget the name of his. He's got a party, and I forget the name of the party, but he's also you know a political organizer of one of the not very large but perhaps influential parties in Russia, and he, um, you, you know, he's he's. Uh, he, he moves in every conceivable direction uh, uh, intellectually as as a as an academic. He writes on political theory, metaphysics, mythology, um, eschatology, you know, and and he, he so, so that makes him congenial to me to a certain degree because I try to do that too. I don't want to get stuck. I mean that that's that's the one thing I can do, show the relationships between these different fields of of knowledge, and uh, he's attempted to do that as well. So it was sort of natural I could go and read his books and and respond, um, you know, to his various ideas, and I would have a little something to say on about every one of his major themes. Um, my, my critique of him perhaps has little more unity than his own ideology, which is all over the map. But basically, you know, he, he just wants, um, well, I, okay, let's, let's see. His major mythology is there are two great powers in the world. Um, one of them he calls Atlantis. Atlantis is here. You know, Atlantis is the United States, Europe. It's the peoples of the sea. Uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, I'm remembering, um, Buckminster Fuller once in one of his books wrote, he said, Western civilization was founded by Renaissance pirates, you know, and that's his, is pretty much his, his view of the West, which, which is in line with the, uh, the, the myth, I'm going to call it a myth, but the myth and reality of Babylon in uh, the book of the apocalypse, you know, a, a mercantile civilization that's decadent and luxurious. And, you know, and, uh, and is a very much a maritime civilization, you know, and then, um, but the, but the other great power is Eurasia, which he, which he identifies with the great heartland of the Eurasian continent. And, you know, it's land based rather than sea based. Isn't his political party called the Eurasia party? 
That sounds right. Yeah, I believe that's correct. Yeah. And and so so you know he he talks about you know his his idea of geopolitics is wh whoever you know dominates Eurasia will dominate the world. Well, could be, uh, but it's very mythologized, much more than anything coming from the West. You know, we are the Atlanteans. On on, on his website, uh, Geopolitica. You know, the um, he has two two websites, Geopolitica, which this last I looked are still there, Geopolitica and Katakhon. Katechon is more of his Russian Orthodox religious website, and Geopolitica is his more p political website, although there's a lot of, you know, bleed through. But uh, the, um, the motto of his Geopolitica web website is Carthago de Lenda Est, which is Cato the Elder's line that he would say after every speech in the Roman Senate, what, whether it was about, you know, how to fund, fund, you know, the, the renovation of the sewers or anything, anything, he would say, but, but, you know, I will end by saying Carthago Delenda Est, which means Carthage must be destroyed. So he identifies Carthage with, uh, the Atlanteans, with the peoples of the sea and Rome, you know, even though Rome is just as maritime as anybody else, he said, you know, Rome is, is, he's, he's going to identify that with Eurasia somehow, you know, but that's his the idea. And, and Carthago is us, you know, we, we, we must be destroyed. So, which is very interesting because it goes back to, um, actually what in the West would be considered to be fringe archaeology about what Atlantis was. Um, you know, the, 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 there were the mysterious peoples of the sea who, who, who raided in, in, you know, in Mediterranean lands. And they might have been those who founded, um, the Phoenician state, you know, with the, the, the city of Sidon and, and, um, and then, then the, um, a, um, colony of Phoenicia was Carthage. And, you know, the Carthaginians with Hannibal and all of this became, you know, the main enemies of Rome during the Punic Wars. And so it goes back there. And what's interesting is Carthage and, and that part of the world, you know, that, that, that coast of North Africa and also the coast of Spain, uh, uh, have not only a lot of old megalithic sites with that, that ancient polygonal masonry, which, which is an entirely different way of building things and fr from a civilization we, we don't really understand, but it was somebody else than, you know, the classical Greeks. And it's a lot older. And they're actually sunken cities are being discovered in that end of the Mediterranean. So that could have been Atlantis, you know, and all of this is in his mythology, you know, and so, but it's interesting. Uh, if you go back to the, to the apocalypse, well, um, you know, the, the, um, Babylon is to a certain degree sea based, but, ba you know, and, and, and Babylon is also the feminine principle, you know, the decadent feminine principle represented by the whore of Babylon, you know, the l l luxurious, you know, decadent, um, concu you know, the principle of concupiscence. Whereas who in the apocalypse overthrows the whore of Babylon is the beast, the antichrist. You know, and the beast is, is more land based and, and, and he, the beast is the negative masculine principle, you know, and well, he doesn't call it negative. He just says, you know, that's us to a certain degree. We are the Hyperboreans. We, we, we are, are those who, uh, uh, are oriented to the pole star, you know, we, we, we and, and we are the, tr we, we are tradition. We represent tradition. We represent, you know, the, the primordial tradition. And this is his connection, um, with one of the many groups he connects with, you know, which is, uh, Gainonian traditionalism of the traditionalist school, Rene Guinon, and finally Fritjof and all of those people. Well, he tries to claim them as well. As do you. Yeah. And me. Yeah. He tried. Yeah. I just went on Amazon to see, to make sure that his books had been dropped, you know, and I put in Alexander Dugan. Uh, the fourth political theory, which is his major manifesto, more or less designed for the West. But, you know, and, and what should I get? But, uh, the first thing on the list is this book by yours truly, you know, yeah. Dugan against Dugan. 
um, which is, you know, uh, so according to Amazon, I actually am Alexander Dugan. So you ask, ask me any questions about Dugan and anything I say w w will be absolutely true because I'm all that's left of Dugan on, on uh, Amazon. Uh, now it's interesting. You can buy that book and find, um, an awful lot about, you know, hit the specific themes he deals with, uh, in, um, the fourth political theory, the rise of the fourth political theory in Eurasian Mission, which are the books I drew upon to to, uh, to critique his ideas. So, I mean, a case could be made that if you want to buy something to to find out about Alexander's ideas, buy my book, because that's all that's left of him. On the other hand, you're, there's there's going to be a certain bias in that book, which you know, I I, I my, my uh, an analysis of what he was is saying will not be the same as his own. I interviewed Gary Lockman, a metaphysical historian who's written about Holy Russia and has written also about the uh, metaphysical movements underlying the alt-right and American politics. And uh, one of the things that he addresses is something I didn't understand very well. I probably still don't. Known as chaos magic, it's uh, some occult tradition, and he uh, showed me pictures of Dugan speaking publicly with the big chaos magic symbol, which is a sort of an eight-pointed star. That's his symbol for his Eurasian movement, you know. But it's very much like the chaos. I wouldn't say it's identical to, to the chaos magic symbol, but it certainly seems to be designed to suggest that. Yeah. Well, chaos magic, this is his problem with his metaphysic. I mean, you know, okay, chaos magic, let's see, ceremonial magic of the Renaissance, where we get all those grimoires and, you know, a Bremelin the mage and, and you know, um, it, 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 the short form is basically like this. Well, it was in the Christian framework, the Christian um, cosmology. So, so Christ, Christ has, by his redemption, uh, has conquered the kingdom of Satan. Therefore, any Christian has a right to employ these conquered beings, these demons, you know, to do his work for him. Right? So, yeah, you know, you, 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 you. you you uh, conquer a nation and, and you sell its people into slavery, and so they we will make them our slaves. And so what mm -hmm. what you do is you, if you do uh, austerities, you know, and purif self purification, you invoke the angels to give you the power to dominate the demons, so you they they will do what you want. Now that that's a a, a very simple form of it, and there are a lot of lot of variations. I mean, don't don't it's no way limited to that. But that's sort of one of the main themes of Renaissance magic. It's based upon a recognized cosmology, whereas chaos magic says there is no reality. You know, chaos magic is based upon the principle of, let us say, nothing is true, therefore everything is permitted. It's very much postmodern magic. There is no overarching paradigm, no, you know, uh, structure to reality. It's all up for grabs. It's all, you know, shapeless potential. And so the will of the mage enters this shapeless potential and, you know, posits something, let it, let it be this, you know, into the chaos of, 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 of quantum uncertainty or whatever you want to call it, you know, pure potentia. And, you know, let it be this. And if he's got enough, you know, power, then out, out of, out of that chaos, you know, he, he can draw what he wants. So that's, that's how chaos magic is different from traditional ceremonial magic. Um, and in a certain sense, Dugan is, is like that, you know, be, be, because he, he, his, his views are, I mean, it, it's a chaos of opposing views, of opposing groups that, 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 that he was appealing to. I'm going to say was because things undoubtedly have totally changed since the, the invasion of Ukraine. But before that, he was reaching out to everybody under the sun. He reached out to my uh, colleague in the Covenants Initiative, Dr. John Andrew Morrow. Uh, and Moro met him on the Arba'in pilgrimage, uh, in Iraq, which is the Shia pilgrimage to the Shia holy sites in Iraq. You know, and, and, uh, 
and, and Dugan spoke, you know, to, to, to the uh, assembled pilgrims, you know, to the Shia, which, of course, has to do with R- R- Russia's um, alliance with Iran, no, you know, no, no doubt. Uh, but uh, Dr. Morrow came back and said, well, I, I, I'm, I'm, and he met with Alexander, Alexander Dugan for a while and, and, and spoke with him, you know, and had, had an interview. And uh, he came back and said, well, I've met Alexander Dugan. He's, he's really nice. He's a very humble, spiritual man who wants only f- f- for, for all the, um, you know, the various nations and cultures and religions that have been oppressed by, by Western uniform, uniformity, where, where you have a, a McDonald's golden arches in outer Mongolia and all of this, you know, we wants he just wants them, to, them to be free and to, 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 uh, uh, you know, to determine their own destinies in, in historical destinies and, and Russia will help them in this. Now you can't though really be the umbrella for everybody else's freedom without turning into an oppressor pretty quick. You know, that's pretty obvious. But anyway, that, that, that was, he, he talked a good game. And then I just showed Dr. Morrow some of the crazy statements he made, which is, well, we don't, we don't like ISIS, but we're willing to work with them, uh, because the first thing is to destroy the West. Then we'll deal with, deal with that, the problems later, you know. And I'm saying, you know, I, I, I put that, I have a little PDF, which, which excerpts from, from my book called, um, uh, Dugan against Islam. I have another little PDF called Dugan against the traditionalists, you know, where, where he took the doctrines of Rene Guinan and inverted them directly, you know, and, uh, so he was not a tradition, not really a traditionalist and certainly not really a friend of Islam, just against the West for who was going to get control of the Tukfiri terrorists, you know, and, and, you know, if the Russians, Russians could, could dominate ISIS and use them, they would. And if we could, we would. And that's what was going on until they became so bad that everybody had to had to dump on them because they were going to destroy everything. One of your biggest bugaboos, I think, is what you call inverted spirituality. That in the name of spirituality, promulgating something that is actually the opposite. Yeah, which is so common now. That's I mean, that's almost the watchword of our time. That's, you know, if, 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 if you want to use concepts like the Antichrist or what the Muslims called al-Dajjal, that's the watchword of the regime of, of Antichrist will be that definite kind of inversion. That's what um, Rene, Rene Guinon predicted because he said, and I mean, his, his categories are holding better than those of Marx. You know, Marx still has some things to say, you know, which, which, which we, we have, we should you know, understand as legitimate critique of capitalism, not as a good thing to turn into, a, you know, a, a resurgence of the communist oppression, which, you know, it, 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 Marx, like a lot of people, was a great critic, but but when it came to pr- prescribing for the disease, you know, he diagnoses, then you prescribe for the disease, something worse than the disease itself. So, which is true of most critics in general. So Gannon's categories uh, are amazing because he said, well, um, at the end, you know, as, as the end of the Manvantra or the cycle of manifestation of this, this world age um, is approached, and uh, I think it's pretty clear that's where we're getting, uh, he said, you, you will first have anti-tradition, which is materialism. It was like the height of anti-tradition was maybe the late 19th century. Um, and, uh, you know, in, on, under this regime, the uh, access of this world to higher or subtler worlds is almost entirely cut off. We're inside a material world and that's that. You know? And then he says... But at one point, this this cosmic environment that, w- that we have inherited and or created will become so brittle that it'll start to crack. And so subtle influences will start to come back. But first and foremost, they will come back f- from below, from the infernal regions or from what he called the, the infra-psychic. You know? And then so... so um, 
So he says, when, when the reign of quantity, the reign of quantity, that's his major prophetic book, the reign of quantity and the signs of the times, the reign of quantity is materialism. And when, when that, when that starts to crack, then, then you will have ultimately a, a return of the reign of quality, which is what higher and earlier world ages, um, represent that, that where society is based upon an apprehension of the eternal archetypes. We have sacred societies. But he said, uh, after the reign of quantity, when the reign of quality comes back, it will be a reign of inverted quality and an inverted hierarchy. And I think Alexander Dugan is the very quintessence of the theology of the inverted hierarchy. And, uh, it's funny. It, 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 it seems on, on a certain sense to be traditional and, um, and even sacred, except he never mentions God. All he said about God was, well, we have to pu put off questions about God until we've dealt with this, this stuff, uh, that we really have to deal with historically and, 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 you know, getting rid of the United States and Western civilization and, you know, and bringing Russia back. We do all that first. Then we can have God. Now, that's what he says in the fourth political theory. In, in his uh, website, Karechon, totally different. He's speaking to the Russian Orthodox. He has beautiful meditations on, on Russian Orthodox theological themes and saints and this. And it's lovely and it's true. The weird thing is he doesn't really believe any of it because he doesn't really believe anything because he is a profound nihilist. Ideas are simply utilitarian. You know, and, and he gets this from, from, uh, the communists as well. This is, this is the way they were with ideas. Ideas only matter if they get something done. Proxies. You know, you get something done, but you know, are they true in themselves? Ah! You know, if you can't get any cash value out of them, who cares? You know, that was very much the communist way of looking at things. Well, I'm under the impression that, uh, he, advocates spreading chaos. Uh, he's advocated, if I understand it correctly, that, that Russia should do everything it can to exacerbate all the cultural and racial and uh, intellectual uh, and social differences amongst uh, Americans and, and Western Europeans. Yeah. And, and so, you know, the, 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 those who say that, that um, you know, Trump, Trump's uh, idea that, that Russia was interfering with the elections was, was simply a crazy conspiracy theory of, of, of right-wing idiots. No. I mean, the, I, the, there, there's a, a passage in his magnum opus, which I don't know if it's been translated yet. I, I found an awful translation by Google. It was unreadable. Um, the the uh, Foundations of Geopolitics. And he just said, this is what we do. We exacerbate all uh, uh, social uh, conflicts and, and polarities within the United States and, you know, and, and, and also uh, anything we can do to, to, uh, to enhance the, the, the isolationist tendencies of the United States, um, you know, we should do. And, you know, I mean, Trump was to a certain degree the expression of that. I'm not saying Trump, Trump was simply, you know, an agent of Russia, but, um, Dugan, you know, during the Trump years, got a certain amount of what he wanted. And I'm, I'm not even saying that, that what he wanted was all produced b b by, by the Russians, by, by, you know, secret influences coming from Russia. You know, he, he was just discerning the weaknesses in the West and, and saying we need to exacerbate. Some, some of it was probably, you know, uh, Russia based, but a lot of it was just, you know, his view of, of the weakness of his opponent. And he was very accurate in that. He was very critical of uh, democracy, very critical of liberalism, and uh, very critical of postmodernism. But at the same time, you, you suggest he's uh, sort of an archetypal postmodernist. That's, that's the kind of nihilism you get in here. You know, he has the, this is the best critique of postmodernism I've re ever read. This guy is great. But you look at his whole method, his whole worldview, postmodern, you know, it, it quint quintessentially. So, you know, that kind of contradiction and inversion, you know, um, you, you, you have to accept that, 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 
that that's and 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 he's not just doing that accidentally you know it's it's a kind of applied nihilism you know and um so right <laughs> yes you want to you want to see how a postmodernist thinks um contradictions that 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 are not considered to invalidate an argument you know i mean but, but like like i said in my book um uh, well this goes back. This is very American. I, mean, I, I said to uh, uh, Professor Dugan, you, you, "You're quite an American in doing this." This goes back to Emerson and Whitman. You know, Emerson said, "You know, uh, uh, consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds," and Whit Whitman said, uh, "You know, I contradict myself very well. I contradict myself. I am vast. I contain multitudes." Which is uh, actually a song, uh, a, 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 a phrase that uh, Bob Dylan <laughs> did in a recent song of his. You know, Dylan actually can't sing anymore, but he, he did a very interesting um, recitation of a poem to music that he wrote about about that uh, that line from Walt Whitman. I've always enjoyed that line from Walt Whitman. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's it's not all bad, but it's it's just, uh, yeah. I mean, and and I th I think I think that was wonderful and liberating when the United States was expanded. I'm vast. I contain multitudes. Why, why do we have to go back to, to to these little, you know, conceptual and traditional boxes that it has to be this or that? You know, you know, anything is possible. Well, there's a point at which anything is possible is a very liberating thing. You know, with God, all things are possible. So beautiful. Let's, let's explore all these wonderful possibilities. But when the expansion is no longer happening culturally, when things start to contract, and in my opinion, they've been contracting ever since 1968 when uh, Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix died. <laughs> At that moment, I said, this is the peak. We're not going to go beyond this. You know, and the expansion, of course, was, you know, we, we can fight Vietnam. We can fight anybody. We've got the power. You know, and then that's the negative part of it. The, 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 um, the positive part of it was, was all the, the explosion of imaginative ideas that came out in the 60s. Well, wow, right. But then it starts to contract, and when when it contracts, the, the the those multiple possibilities slowly but surely become excruciating contradictions. You know, I contradict myself, but I'm no longer vast, and all the multitudes that I collected are being squeezed together and starting to fight each other, and that's what we're getting in the society. You know, so. That was that was a wonderful statement for its time, but for our time, uh, it doesn't work in the same way. And to be fair, I think uh, you write in your book that you largely agree with Dugan's critique of uh, liberal democracy. Oh, I, I think he has a wonderful critique, just like Marx had a wonderful critique of capitalism, but look what he did with it. I mean, it would seem as if the war in Ukraine, the incredible turmoil and chaos that is taking place as we speak in Ukraine today is an outcome of this chaos magic ideology. Well, to a certain degree. Um, and um, I mean, there, there was a, uh, a video I saw of Dugan before, before the war, you know, on, on the web where he... Uh, he was just cursing the Ukrainians. Oh, man, it must be destroyed, you know. Now, what we don't know is what was so threatening about the U Ukrainians to the Russians. That they, they, they had a legitimate reason to feel threatened. The United States, you know, was, was making, and the CIA, and it was making incredible inroads there, probably Mossad and everybody else. And what, what were they planning? Were they doing, um, you know, Biological weapons laboratories, you know, that, that, whose weapons were going to be directed against Russia were, you know, and were, was there a big Nazi influence in the Ukraine? There probably was. There also was 
in Russia through uh, through Alexander Dugan, you know, who drew upon Nazi ideologues like Carl Schmitt, you know, who, who, who is like one of the few Nazis that survived World War II to become sort of a recognized intellectual in the post-war era, you know, with, with a particular idea of legalism and this, you know, I don't know much about Schmidt, but, you know, you know, he, he has little, little problem with, with, with turning to certain Nazi influences. So, you know, both sides are saying, you know, you're the Nazis. No, you're the Nazis. Well, there, nobody's the Nazis. That was then, you know, the, 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 the Ukrainians, you know, were, were a vector of, of a great deal of aggression coming from the West and NATO and God knows on how many levels you know, directed at Russia to contain Russia, to perhaps produce regime change in Russia. And the Russians responded, you know, in, in an incredibly violent and evil way, bringing out all of their evil influences, you know, and, and uh, ideologically and, and now, now in action. And, you know, this is where I like to sit back and say, I'm not going to take sides here. You know, I mean, if, 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 if I want the Ukraine to win, if I want Russia, you know, I just, all I want is Russia not to nuke us. I would like that. And I don't know, I don't know what the closest way to do that is. If, 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 if they totally lose in the, in the Ukraine, will they be, you know, well chastened and pulled back and not do that? Or will that force them to say, you know, we, we, we'd rather destroy the world than, than, you know, let this be done to us. And remember, remember, it's possible to, 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 for a whole nation to have a suicidal impulse if they feel that their back is to the wall. We, you know, we, we, we should not discount that possibility. But in any case, um, this is what I see as the meaning of in the apocalypse and the Quran. The apocalypse, you know, at the end of time, Gog and Magog. Will arise, or in in the Quran, Juj and Majuj, same same forces. What are these forces? I see them as huge, titanic, uh, opposing forces, which appear to be real alternatives. You know, I mean, this is what we do. We we, we sit here and say, you know, um, you know, if 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 Biden and and the Democrats are doing these terrible things, you know, of of, of bringing in transgenderism and transhumanism, then any any um, you know anything we do, you know, to to oppose them is justified, no matter how violent, no matter how crazy, no matter how, how illegal. So anything Trump does is justified against Biden or Trump, you know, a criminal from day one. You know, who's gotten away with murder for decades? You know, uh, so so anything that that the the, the, the uh, Republican that the uh, Democrats, you know, and and the uh, ju Judiciary Committee and and you know the Justice Department can do against Trump is justified because Trump is evil. You know, I mean, this is a mess, and um, you see why I haven't voted in a presidential election for many years. I just, I, this is the way I look at it. And you, you have these forces fighting each other. And, and w we have, the human beings have a tendency to say, I, uh, the alternatives in the world, I got to choose one of them. What's, you know, what's, which side are you on? Bob Dylan had a good reaction to that. He said, praise be to Nero's Neptune, the Titanic sails at dawn. Everybody's shouting, which side are you on? Well, the boat is going down. It doesn't matter which side you're on, right? And, you know, that, that, that was <laughs> a great song, you know, taking off from an old... Uh, Woody Guthrie, which side are you on, boys? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and, and, of course, you know, you know now, now G G Guthrie, remember, remember, he wrote on the back of his guitar... Uh, this machine kills fascists. So in the World War II, you could, it could be pre pretty clear. You could actually take the right side, even though there's a lot of evil in the right side and some good in the wrong side. There was, you could see what the lesser of two evils was, except for Russia, which we had to, <laughs> we had to ally with, which became the next vast evil in the world. And, and the United States became more and more and more evil in fighting fire with fire when it comes to Russia, which, you know, and then Vietnam came along and we really lost our moral superiority at that point. And so it ends up to be the same mess. The world, the dunya, 
the darkness of this world. You know, the principalities and powers who are the rulers of the darkness of this world. That's what we need to fight, not get into this to, 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 to the mess of the world and choose one of these sides and end up doing as much evil as if we'd chosen the others. Now, what's interesting, though, that said, with the covenants initiative, I saw for the first time in years, hey, this is something that's actually just good. You know, this is not one of those. Um, you know, it's not Gog or Magog, one of those uh, terrible alternatives that seems to be an alternative, but it's actually as bad as its, as its opponent. This is something where a, a, a real action for good can be done. You know, and um, so, so with the covenants, you know, our, our movement is now in abeyance because it was stopped like so many things by COVID. And now Dr. Morrow gets back to me and says, well, all of these people want me to speak, but they're all partisan groups. You know, the Sunnis, you know, want to adopt the covenants to use them against the Shia. The Shia want to adopt the covenants to use them against the Sunnis and, and, and plenty of other groups at the same time. Since I don't know who, who you know, I, do, do I just not accept any of these speaking engagements or do I accept all of them? What do I do? I don't know the answer to that, but you know, that, that's, that's the state of things now. But, but there was a moment there. And actually, the Trump years opened up that moment. Um, Trump, I understand the Republicans who say, I like his policies, but we got to get rid of him, you know. Um, and, and that's, that's not my simple position either. But, um, we could really do something. It, it was, it was miraculous that, that in such dark times, we could do something that, that was, what I consider to be filled with light, and but you never know if that if such a thing will be possible again. Well, I guess an important part of uh, Rene Guénon's theology, metaphysics, is that we are in a, a, a dark time, the end of times, the Kali Yuga, or something similar. And and Dugan is saying something about like that. Yeah, he is, but. You know, th there's nothing ab about the second coming of Christ, which you would think that an Eastern Orthodox Christian would talk about. He doesn't like to talk about God. He believes, you know, if there is, you know, he's, he's following Heidegger. And I don't know enough about Heidegger. I just know what, what Heidegger as presented by Dugan, you know, made me think, you know, Heidegger is bad news. He may have some, some wonderful metaphysics that I haven't, you know, had time to read, you know. Or haven't had, you know, taken, taken, you know, fulfilled my responsibility in reading. But what, what he, the ideas he takes from, from Heidegger are terrible. He Heidegger says the time of the logos is past. Well, the logos, of course, in Christian terms is Christ. The time of order and, you know, and, and harmony is past. Now it is the time of chaos. Well, there's some truth to that. I mean, that's, that's what Guénon said, more or less. But, but, but Guénon said out of, out of the chaos will emerge the inverted hierarchy, which will be the regime of, of Al-Dajjal of Antichrist. Whereas Dugan says out of the chaos will emerge us, you know, we will, you know, we will uh, uh, project the chaos of, 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 of Atlantis and, and, and the Western nations back upon itself because they are based upon chaos, eh, because they're feminine. So... We will project that back on them and, and they will, they will fall apart and then we will emerge as the great big new, great big new thing. Okay. That's not what Kenon said because the great big new thing, as far as he was concerned, would be the Antichrist. And Dugan just gets so far as to say, well, we'll deal with that later. We just need to get rid of the West. We have to become the Antichrist to get, to get rid of the West. And cool. Cool. Why not? You know, you know, the, the first things first. I'm sorry. I can't go along with that. Now, what about the significance of the feminine in Dugan's uh, metaphysics? Well, or in Gainon's? To, to go back to Gainon, th there is a tendency, which is understandable. I mean, Gainon's basic idea of the manvantara, of the cycle of manifestation, is it moves from the pole of essence to the pole of substance. Um, so, his brilliant thing is to look at the Hindu doctrine of the cycle of manifestation in terms that were basically Aristotelian, you know, 
So, so the, the masculine principle is form, is essence, uh, yet it has no substance in this world because, you know, it is still in the realm of ideas. Whereas the, the feminine principle is substance or potential. It's all the possible. It's, it's like quantum indeterminacy. You know, it's, 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 it's the, 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 the substratum of matter, all the things, you know, uh, but it has no form. And, you know, a substantial form, according to Aristotle, any real thing is produced by the union of those two principles. Ideas gain substance, you know, you know, unformed matter is redeemed from its formlessness through ideas. So that's, you know, so, but the problem is, um, it's possible to wrongly understand the fact that, you know, the, the, to, to adopt the idea that the masculine principle is, is a principle of good and, and, and we're, we're, we're degenerating to the fem feminine principle, which is the principle of evil. You know, um, Guénon didn't quite say that, but that implication is floating around as ideas some. You, you find it in Western mythology, the very notion it was Eve who tempted Adam with the apple and they were banished from paradise. Yeah. But, but before Eve was the serpent, and after all, you know, what what was Adam if if, if he would, you know, give into that temptation? So I mean, yeah, th there is that tendency. But of course, there's also the Virgin Mary, who is the second Eve, who redeems the whole thing. If it wasn't for for her, if it wasn't for, you know, the the, the myth that that that, that I understand or see is that there were women, pious women in, in, in the Jewish world. Some of them worked as a kind of guild of temple seamstresses who would sew the, uh, you know, the, 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 the sacred, um, you know, cloths of, of the altar and things like this. And, and uh, they were praying that one of them would be the mother of the Messiah. And finally, that fell upon the Virgin Mary. You know, that that came to her. And what amazes me is the other women were weren't jealous. So, if it wasn't for for for, for her profound receptivity to the divine, there would have been no Christian. So that's that 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 redeems Eve. So you you know, and that that's why the Virgin Mary in, in Catholicism is called the co-redemptrix. So it isn't, it isn't simply, you know, but you have problems with, um, St. Augustine, you know, women have no souls. Oh, yeah. You know, Augustine, w one of the greatest theologians of the church, but look at that. So anyway, um, where is, where is Dugan? I mean, he, he, he doesn't address, as far as I know, that, that issue directly. But yet he's, you know, he, 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 he damns the West for, for basing itself upon chaos and for being like Babylon, you know. But at the same time, he's willing to use chaos as a political tool. So, you know, but, uh, in both cases, I think he identifies the founding principle to a degree with chaos. Whereas, you know, that, that's, that's the negative feminine principle, just as the negative masculine principle is is self-will, fixed ideas, you know, you know, narrow, rigid thinking, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, so um, anyway, I don't, I don't think Dugan is, does not directly deal with that issue, but but he's he he has an unholy relationship to chaos. He says now we're we're in the era of chaos. The era of logos has passed, which means the era of Christ has passed, and um, now. Out of the chaos, that this perennial error, that out of chaos will come the new thing. All you have to do is destroy everything, because that's easy. You know, that, that that's in, in line with entropy. It's in line with, with, with the flow of the universe to entropy. Just to break it all up, and then out of that will come a new thing. Well, order does not come out of chaos. What happens is old order is broken up, and then you have a receptive substrate, you know, in, in, and which is represented in, in the Christian world by the Virgin Mary. You have a receptive substratum that turns to eternal order and says, you know, 
come. And eternal order listens and, and sends a new design for a new age, you know, in, in, into that receptive substratum and fertilizes it. And the two, the two poles come together and then you have a renewal. But it doesn't just come from creating chaos. There are often many twists and turns along the way as well. Yeah, certainly. And I just wonder, you know, before, I was wondering where Dugan was at. Because I was wondering if Putin was saying, looking at Dugan, is saying, this is the guy that suckered me into going into the Ukraine. You know, so many of Dugan's so-called allies are dying. I don't know. If they're being assassinated by the CIA, I don't know if they're being assassinated by Putin because this is his chance to get rid of the oligarchs with whom he has had to share power in the West. We say, well, those are his allies. Well, he had to ally with them. They had money. He was an oligarch, too. He has plenty of money in Switzerland, you know. So who was killing these people off? I don't know. But I was wondering... You know, what was was he uh, was he going to assassinate Dugan because you know Dugan uh, you know led him astray? I, I I have no idea if that's true. But then um, th there there you know in, in our completely more than biased in, in in our simply nakedly propagandistic media now we have no idea if what, if what is said about Ukraine is true to the slightest degree. We just know the line that's being laid down. And, and in war, boy, the fog of war is, is also a conscious weapon of war. You know? So, um, we don't, we don't know about these stories, but the story comes out that Dugan said something that would indicate that Putin should be got rid of. You know, it's something about the killing of the king, killing of the sacred king in uh, Sir James Fraser's uh, The Golden Bow, and, you know, the, uh, because Dugan, you know, likes to think mythologically, and, you know, if we, we kill the old king because he's been, becoming feeble and doesn't work, we'll get a new king, and, and, and the nation will be renewed, you know. Um, he was reported as saying something like that, and then later he vociferously denied that he'd ever said anything like that. Well, I thought when that was reported, he was either, this is, and I, I don't believe this is the case, but this, uh, to tell you how my thinking was going, I was thinking, well, either, um, you know, m maybe he feels, you know, he's in, in Dugan's sight, I mean, uh, in the Putin's sights already, and, you know, his last chance is to call for a coup against Putin to save his own life, you know, uh, or... You know, and, and then and then that turned out not to be true because I believe that he did, you know, I accept that, that he denied that. Maybe the coup didn't materialize and he had to say, I never said that. I don't. You know, armchair generals, what do we know? Especially inside of Russia. We, we don't have good information at all. Yeah, well, but also inside the United States. I mean, really, we, we live in more of an engineered control system in terms of information than most of us have any conception. We remember when there was an, an independent, you know, of, you know, what fifth estate of journalism. We remember when there was really freedom of speech, when what you were allowed to say was not controlled by uh, algorithms. But that, those times are over. Well, just as a point of information, I, without debating you, I disagree with that principle. We needn't debate it. I'm willing to see where it takes you. I hope oh, you're right. You know, possibly I get too cynical and, and say, I don't believe anything anymore. Well, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. I mean, here we are talking yeah. and I hope, you know, uh, I hope neither of us will, will be subject to... Uh, Censorship from what we say. I've never been censored. I've got thousands of videos out at, at this point. And uh, I have to say this in, in terms of our conversations, Charles, I'm amazed at your eloquence and your ability to 
uh, take a very subtle point and find just the right words to express it. I think it's of great value to our viewers. And I know that you uh, try to see things in a balanced way, but of course, we don't agree on everything, which is only normal. Yeah, it's only normal. And um, well, I could, I could say that, that your, 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 your idea that you are free, Jeffrey, is, is a cunningly designed concept that's been implanted in your brain by our, <laughs> our, our uh, uh, you know, information society controlled by the NSA. So, uh, yeah. but uh, <laughs> I'm acting as if still, as if we're living in a free society with, with freedom of speech. So yeah. I'm going to keep acting that way until, until I can't do it anymore. Yeah. Well, with regard to Dugan, You've got the similar issue, which is a man who portrays himself as uh, somewhat of a saintly, pious, holy figure trying to uphold uh, sacred principles and, and yet uh, engaging in behavior that contradicts that uh, stance. Yeah, I mean, and, and there are people in the alt-right who believe that line, who say, you know, Russia is a Christian, you know, traditional Christian nation being attacked by the decadent atheistic West. Well, that truth is there somewhere, but Dugan does not represent uh, Russian orthodoxy. I'm not sure Patriarch Kirill represents it very well either. He used to be KGB after all. And um, there were a number, number of Russian Orthodox hierarchs who denounced Alexander Dugan some quite a few years ago now for attempting to introduce paganism and Satanism into Russian Orthodox. Um, according to uh, a web influencer um, called, now what's his name? Um, I've, yeah, I'm forgetting his name. I, I'm getting this from the web, so I cannot be sure this is true. But his story is... Uh, oh, Freedom Alternative is his name. Uh, his story is that after they denounced Dugan, a number of them were defrocked or died. So um, Dugan might well represent an, an insurgency of very anti-Christian tendencies into uh, Russian Orthodox. And, certain, and, and uh, it, it may be that Patriarch Kirill is going along with it. That's how decadent, you know, the, um, the leadership of, of many of the traditional religions has become, not just Russian Orthodoxy. Well, earlier we were comparing traditional Renaissance ceremonial magic with chaos magic. And uh, you pointed out that they're pretty much the opposite. And this seems to highlight one of the, the, the central paradoxes or self-contradictions of Dugan. Dugan does not believe. I mean, if, if you say, uh, following Heidegger or what he found in Heidegger, that the era of the Logos has passed, then you can no longer refer to a particular view of what reality is. Those views are passé. You can't say reality is hierarchical and, and, and there are these levels and God is this and, and, and the cosmos is that. Yeah, that's all. The slate is wiped clean. Um, so nothing is left but the, the self-will of an individual or a collective in order to make something be true. And that's profoundly nihilistic and profoundly dark. The most powerful guy, you know, on, on, on the block, whoever, whoever is left standing after the big brawl, that's who God is. And that's yeah. essentially Luciferian. That, that, yeah. That's what Lucifer says, you know. I mean, um, he, he looks at God as, as, as another self-willed spiritual power like himself and says, you know, if I get more power than him, I can knock him off the throne and take it myself. If, if I understand your thinking in, in relationship to all of this, your, your central North Star, your guidepost is something I would call actual God, uh, over and above any of our uh, cultural paradigms. Yes. If God isn't real, then our cultural paradigms are nothing but reflections of group psychology. 
How can you worship and, and, and implore mercy from and ask for wisdom from a, a reflection of group psychology? You know, that, God, because, see, postmodernism, one of the things it's very interested in is religion because it sees religion as, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the expression of the aspirations, the fears, you know, the worldview of a particular social group in a particular historical period. And, and this is all very interesting to study. Yeah. But if that's, if you leave it at that, then you're nothing but an atheist. There is no God because God has got to be real. The living God is the one who is beyond our subjectivity. You know, uh, it, it, God does not contact us. We do not come into relationship with God without an ex a, a subjective experience on our part. Otherwise, there's no contact between us. But that subjective experience is not him. You know, that, 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 that's, that's uh, an influence coming from him entering our subjectivity and transforming it. But we always tend to worship our ideas of God and forget that God is beyond all our ideas and is also ultimately the author of everything that becomes an idea on our part because of he, he not only created us to begin with, but he creates us in every moment. And, you know, we, we must maintain our connection with the idea of a God who is absolute objectivity beyond all our ideas. That uh, is, uh, I think, a statement that I would concur with. Yeah, because otherwise we're, we're chaos magicians in a certain sense. I'll create a God. You know, we all need God, so I'll create a God that, 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 that'll, uh, you know, that'll be to my liking and will do my bidding. If I don't like that God, I'll kill him off and create a different God. That's, that's paganism in its negative sense. You know, that's paganism as seen by the prophetic tradition of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. That's, that's how they define paganism. Paganism had more to it than that. It had some sense of an objective God, but, um, that tendency to idolatry is, um, you know, is what the, uh, the, the prophets of the Abrahamic line were sent to uh, overturn. Abraham could not deal with all of the huge religious system of Mesopotamia, vast, powerful. You know, he left, he went to the wilderness and met God one-on-one. -on -one. Same with Moses, who couldn't deal with the same vast system of Egypt, but went and met God in the burning bush, one on one, you know, and and out of those came the religions, which of course produced their own idols, because that's what we do. We're, human beings are great idol manufacturers, and we turn the religions themselves into idols, and you know, so so no good comes of them, you know, to us from them anymore because we've done that. But the whole impulse of the, of the Abrahamic prophetic line was that we encounter the living God and leave the idolatry behind, which is a constant practice <laughs> because we all, you know, we all worship our own ideas. Well, I gather it's a practice you take very seriously. And, and the fact that you, you see Dugan as, as uh, espousing a similar practice, but at the same time contradicting it in his actions is incredibly disturbing to you. I mean, he, he goes to, you know, to, to some group like, like the Finns, you know, the Finns, and he says, your ancient, your, uh, you know, mythology is wonderful. We support it, you know, the, the Kalevala, you know, the, the Tsampo, you know, this, this, is, this is your ethnic, you know, you know View, view of divinity, and we're for that, and then we're for, and he goes to every conceivable group that 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 you know that has a different conception of God. Says, all these conceptions are valid. We will gather them. You know, Mother Russia will gather them all together, and they will all live in harmony. Well, no, it's it be, because he's making them idols. Everyone, this is what Rome did. Rome would would appropriate the gods of its conquered peoples and put up statues of them in the Roman pantheon. So for those, con for those conquered peoples, if their religions were, were alive, each one of those gods was, was a conception that worked for that culture and that civilization, that nation of the absolute reality. Whereas when 
that God was was kidnapped, you know, taken his booty back to Rome and, and, and installed as, as a, a statue in the, in the Pantheon, these were no longer transcendent principles or no longer approaches to the transcendent principles. They were all worshiping Rome. They were all the clients of, of the Roman state. And ultimately, the Roman Empire, emperor, emperor considered to be divine. And uh, th th that's that's kind of what Dugan, you know, th that's the end of Dugan's attempt to, 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 you know, gather in all the religions. This is what happened to the Tower of Babel, I think. You know, I, I, I think I think the Tower of Babel was an attempt to 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 to, to through, through, through power through imperial power to, to, to make a pan-religious uh, reality. And it failed at one point, or it was established and then fell apart. And then, you know, th th there was a confusion of tongues. And each one of the gods went its own way into its own ethnic world. And who knows if they were the same after that. You know, they might have all been idols after that. I know. It's a long time ago. Yeah. But that's kind of... Uh, that's the problem with Dugan, uh, what he wanted. Now, c can this still continue after, after the invasion of Ukraine? I don't know. I don't see how it can. You know, he put everything together and, you know, th this is what he collected in order to gain the power in the name of Russia to, to throw off the Western influence. Did it work? I don't know. It, it, it still, what continues is that the various groups you know, perhaps Nordic pagans and such in, in, involved with the alt right in Europe, who still can you know look to do. You know, that's probably still in place. But I don't see how he can range around the world at this point. You know, collecting everybody else's gods. I mean, the the, the little the little states around Russia. You know, that, that Russia wanted to, uh, you know, be be the uh, the patron of and 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 extend its influence into. Well, maybe, maybe Russia can still do that. But every one of those states is, is saying, look what happened to Ukraine. Will we be next? Maybe we need to look elsewhere, maybe to China or something for patronage. Maybe we need to balance Russian patronage against some counter patronage to, to, to just save our independence. They're all thinking that. I don't know what they're doing about it. And, and the world is on the precipice of what could become a much larger war if it's not, if it's not resolved somehow. Yes, it is. Well, on that friendly note, I think uh, we pretty much covered all the ground here for today. Let me just advertise this book. Like I say, I am now, as far as Amazon is concerned, I am now Alexander Dugan. So if you want to know <laughs> what Alexander Dugan thinks, buy my book, because really, this is probably the most comprehensive presentation of his ideas available in the United States now because you can't get his own books anymore. So I quote him a lot. So, you know, you, you want to know about him Buy the book. Well, you know, it might be worth mentioning parenthetically for our viewers and listeners that you and I had an exchange earlier in which you suggested I should reach out to Dugan and interview him. And I said, well, I don't know enough about him. Why don't you interview him and we'll put it on New Thinking Aloud? And I guess nothing has come of that offer yet. Yeah. And, and you know, if uh you, heretofore, you have lived in a world of freedom of speech, but there is a point at which, you know, you might, uh, you might jeopardize that. You know, who knows? <laughs> I do want Dugan. I mean, he's, he's still on Facebook and they haven't taken down his websites because they want to see what he's saying. Well, I, I still extend the offer to Dugan to come and be interviewed by you or, or by me or by both of us on, on this channel. Why not? Let's let's you know, let let's see if and, and and we'll see how possible that is based upon, um, you know, the, the 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 limitations coming from Russia and the limitations coming from the West. Well, given the the perilousness of the world situation right now, maybe uh, dialogues like that could be helpful. Yeah, I mean, I would just like to say, Dugan. I mean. Um, do you think there is a tendency to say that if if Russia must be dominated by NATO and by the West, 
they, Russia and the world, we would all be better off dead. Because that's possible. That, that's what happens to an individual, as we see in this country where there's so many guns floating around. Somebody feels their back is to the wall. The whole world is against them. You know, they don't have room to breathe. And they'd say, well, I'm going to get a gun, go out and kill 20 people and then take a couple of deep breaths because now I'm free for a moment. Then I'll blow my own brains out. And that happens almost every day in this country. Could that happen to a whole nation? That's the question I want to ask. Good question, Charles. And once again, thank you so much for being with me. Okay. Glad to do it. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you as well for being with us. Thank you.